Wawena bojo, wabanang akikwe and dijna kas wab jishi do dem, migma anishnabe kwe and dao, dom guk donjaba apading mede kwe and dao. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good day, where whatever time it is where you are joining us from. Welcome to the Canadian um, to the Mental Health Commission of Canada's webinar on life promotion, changing the the um, narrative. Um, I am Kelly Brownbill. I'm going to be your moderator today. I have introduced myself to you in uh, Anishinaabe Moen, but my English name is Kelly, which you can refer to me as. I am very proud to be a member of the Flat Bay Band of Mi'kmaq people on the beautiful island of Newfoundland. I am Martin Clan and a member of the Three Fires Medeoan Society. Today, I would like to first acknowledge that the head office of the Mental Health Commission of Canada is located on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation in what is now called Ottawa, Ontario. We acknowledge that for thousands of years, the Algonquin people protected these lands, the Ottawa River watershed and its tributaries. As a national organization, we also acknowledge that we work on the traditional lands of many different nations. Today, a path of true, a path to truth and reconciliation begins with recognizing both the stewardship and the sacrifices of the original peoples. We are committed to recognizing the errors of the past, acknowledging the challenges of the present, and contributing to a new and respectful relationship with First Peoples. I would also like to acknowledge that um, most of you joining us today may have a personal or professional connection to suicide and the work of suicide prevention. I personally lost my best friend when he chose to take his own life and have had uh, suicide attempts in my family as well. When we hear the tragic news of a loss of a friend, family member, colleague or loved one to suicide, we're reminded of how important the work of life promotion and suicide prevention is. So if anyone is in need of support during or after this webinar, uh, we are able to offer you distance supports through mental health first aid, and we will provide those details shortly. We are also pleased to be offering the webinar in both official languages. Today's webinar will be presented in English with simultaneous French, American Sign Language, and Quebec Sign Language interpretation. You will be able to connect to the French audio by clicking on the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and selecting French as your language. If you would like to follow along to the slides in French, select the presenter with the French presentation. The view options menu on the top of the shared screen provides a list of presenters sharing their screen. The slider between the speaker's camera and the English slides can be adjusted and moved to the left in order to better view the French slides. Please feel free to ask your questions in the language of your choice at any time in the chat. You can do so by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or using the chat box. Questions will be answered during the question and answer period at the end of the presentations. For ease of reference, please indicate which speaker your question is directed to, or if you have, uh, or if your question applies to all speakers. If you are having technical problems, uh, please write in the chat and we will do our very best to assist you. As we all know, talking about suicide can be emotionally heavy topic. Normally, at an in-person meeting, we would have on-site support for anyone who feels the need to get some support while talking about these subjects. Today, we are able to offer you distance supports using Mental Health First Aid and Wellness Together Canada. I invite you to take note of the distress line for your region and or the contact information of Joshua Bauer or Alexi Laplante, who are available to provide distance mental health support. Joshua and Alexi are available by email and can provide support in English and in French respectfully. They will be able to support for the duration of the webinar up until 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will put their contact information as well as some additional information in the chat box. Please do not hesitate to reach out to your local crisis center or distress line for support 
if you feel you need it. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our panelists for today's webinars. We have the pleasure of being joined by experts in the field of life promotion who will share their perspectives and experiences so that we may all better understand how life promotion is changing the narrative in suicide prevention. I will also ask the panelists when they first start to speak with us that they take time to introduce themselves according to their own cultural protocols and to share any information that I haven't that they think is important. I'll start today by introducing Connor Lafortune. Connor is from Dokis First Nation. He works primarily in life promotion, harm reduction, mental health, and Indigenous education through organizations such as the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation, School Mental Health Ontario, and the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Connor aims to tell Turtle Island's whole truth by uplifting voices as an Indigenous, queer, and Francophone youth. Next, we have Karen Main. Karen is a member of the Standing Buffalo Dakota Nation in Saskatchewan. Like many First Nation people and communities, she has all too often experienced the loss of family members and friends due to suicide. Karen's career includes many years of experience working with nonprofit organizations, a crown corporation, a personal care home, and 15 years as the former executive director of Leading Thunderbird Lodge, a residential youth treatment facility. Her current position is as Associate Executive Director for the Youth Solvent Addiction Committee, where she also facilitates the Life is Sacred Life Promotion Training Program. And finally, we have Dr. Debbie Daynard. Uh, Debbie is a honest, traditional knowledge practitioner, a visual and performance artist, lecturer, writer, water protector, Indigenous Life Promotion Ambassador, and a Sturgeon Clan member from the Rainy River First Nation. Growing up, she was raised with her grandmother's love and commitment to sharing traditional Anishinaabek teachings and way of life. Debbie is currently a postdoctorate fellow at the Dalalani Lana School of Public Health with Dr. Angela Mashford Pringle supporting the New Respect Cultural Safety Training. Very excited to have these panelists here and I won't take too much time before I invite them to start sharing their wisdom with us. I just want to introduce to start the whole concept of life promotion and why the Mental Health Commission of Canada chose this topic to invite you all to this discussion. There has been in Indigenous communities for quite a while now a shift in the narrative from suicide to life promotion. At its basic level, that is from really encompasses shifting from deficit based when we already have people in trouble to an asset based approach leading with the language of life. So rather than waiting until people are suicide involved, perhaps in the pre contemplation or contemplation stages, we're trying to promote life as a wonderful thing and that no one would consider suicide. And although I think Indigenous communities have gotten there first, I don't think life promotion needs to be a specifically Indigenous lens. When we talk about Indigenous life promotion, we will talk about the things that made it work for our communities, for our target group. The idea here is not to um, offer those uh, ways of being for you to copy or to emulate, but rather to encourage you to explore the community that you work in. What would be similar life promotion activities, life promotion paradigms that would work in your specific community? So we offer the path that Indigenous communities, Indigenous people have already started to walk as an invitation for you to find your own path from suicide prevention to life promotion. In Indigenous led work so far, um, it was life promotion was developed in response to elevated rights, rates of suicide observed among many Indigenous communities in Canada. This work has been grounded in natural law and has arisen from and reflects the wisdom and circle of Indigenous traditional knowledge. And our panelists today are going to share that with you. 
Um, the concept was about strengthening youth's connection to life and belonging and hope, developing experiences, relational resources, and social conditions that re-engage youth with life rather than coming at it through the suicide prevention lens. The work that has been done has strengthened connections to community, to culture, and to identity. Three of the things that were lost in Indigenous people because of assimilation and genocide perpetrated by the federal government. Um, and so we are regaining those connections to promote that life, creating opportunities for intergenerational learning, honoring cultural practices, recovering our first languages, and recognizing our sacred connections to our lands and our stories. You're going to hear the personal experiences of our panelists in those places. And I encourage you to um, really open your mind and think about your role in life promotion, your role in suicide prevention, and how that paradigm shift might look in your community, for your clients, for your colleagues, for your families. So Without further ado, I want to hear from our wonderful panelists. And I'm first going to ask them all to just give us an overview of what positive impacts they have seen in their work in life promotion. So I'm going to ask Connor to start, if you don't mind, with that question. Hi, um, I'm going to introduce myself uh, first in, in my language. Um, I'm just really happy to be here. Um, a little bit on, on my perspective, I started working in life promotion about uh, two and a half years ago through the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation while creating the Strengthening Our um, Connections to Life Promotion uh, for Indigenous Youth. And so my perspectives are very focused on uh, Indigenous youth and how uh, those communities are affected by uh, life promotion and suicide and mental health and all of those uh, intricacies. Um, the positive impact that I've seen, uh, many of them are very day-to-day -day and uh, anecdotal because that is what um, I, I work directly with with folks. And so I see the, the, the ins and outs of how it affects them uh, explicitly. Um, and I think for me personally, when uh, I'm sharing work in life promotion, when people see the toolkits uh, and things, it is those those emotional reactions to life promotion of just feeling seen and heard um, and understood in the mental health landscape as an Indigenous person and, and, and really having that be directly related to their cultures and to their identities and how they can live in the world and, and the, the specifics of affecting Indigenous people, Indigenous youth. Um, I think it, it also um, has to come from Indigenous people in, in the way that we, we share this knowledge um, of centering youth voices, especially because in our, um, in our project, we had indig 10 Indigenous youth from across Turtle Island, and we led the project from start to finish. And so the power that it has to also just let Indigenous youth um, create without any barriers is really something that, that has, um, has been changing the landscape a little bit more uh, every day. And really seeing older Indigenous folks just seeing the work that, in, that youth are doing and, and being able to uh, finally see themselves and finally see their grandchildren reflected in the mental health landscape has just been um, the most positive thing for me. Um, and a little bit more anecdotally, I was hosting a youth retreat one time uh, and just seeing the transformation of three days, what what that that experience can can do for a child, you know, coming in and they're shy and they don't talk to you at all. And by the end, they are dancing on the table and just like telling you how much this is what they needed and how they'll take this back to their community and actually take care of themselves and, and know that oh, wow, I can think of myself first. Uh, and so that is, for me, that is really the, the most positive impact is, is seeing that on the ground, uh, seeing what, what the youth uh, have to say about it. I'll leave it there. Uh, miigwech. Shimi miigwech, Connor. I'm looking forward to unpacking a little bit of that with you as well. Um, Karen, I'll ask you the same questions. What positive impact have you seen in your work in life promotion? Well, first of all, huh? Petu washte mitakia pe. Good day, all my relatives. My spirit name is Wichaha uh, Kadotui, which is a Red Star woman in uh, Dakota language. My uh, English name is Karen Main, and I too come from Treaty Four territory, uh, Fort Capel, Saskatchewan, Southern Saskatchewan. So it's great to be here to to be with you all and to have this discussion. Um, 
I don't consider myself an expert. I know Kelly used that word <laughs> and I really don't. I, I, I think I'm going to be, well, I know I'm going to be a learner right till I go in the ground. So uh, I don't like to call myself an expert, but um, certainly I've worked in the field of suicide, I guess, with the youth in the residential settings. So my perspective comes from working with the youth and with the Youth Substance Addiction Committee over the past couple of years. Uh, and our program, which I um, help with, which is the uh, Life is Sacred uh, program, uh, the positive impacts we've seen is that there is significant increases in participant knowledge that take take our course. Um, this course was designed initially for treatment centers, those that work in treatment centers, and then it's been taken out to community members as well. Uh, there's a lot of open dialogue about suicide prevention, life promotion, and the workplace and community. And that's good because a lot of times in our community, suicide was not talked about. Life promotion certainly has a more positive um, aspect to it. Uh, so people are more open to that. Also, our program has seen a significant increase in worker confidence in the helpers and the frontline workers. And that's what we like to see. We want to give people the confidence uh, to go out and, and work in this field. And also the teaching from the community inquiry model, the table talk, the dialogue, it's nurturing local and individual expertise because a lot of people, as I mentioned, don't feel confident in working in this field or don't think they're the right person, but we try to say right person, right time, right place. I'll leave it there, Kelly, thanks. Uh, Chibi Gwetch, Karen, and I love that in, that introduction of not just doing this work for um, clients or patients or community members, but to actually strengthen the caregivers. Um, we know, particularly as we have come through this horrible time in the past few years, how hard it has been on our practitioners, on our caregivers, in our communities, and if we can empower them, um, I think that the work, you know, the positive impact becomes exponential. So Chimi Gwetch for sharing that. Um, Debbie, would you like to comment? When Bojo, Neil Gwene Beacon to go, Nami Do Dam, and Nishnabe, Mede Wan Kwain Dao, Manchubuatko, Ninda Unji, Ninda Beri Nungum. My English name is Debbie. Um, I guess the first thing I want to do is acknowledge the Nishnabe Aski. Uh, nation youth who originally brought to our attention that um, life promotion is something that they were seeking to address the, um, I don't want to say the suicide epidemic in their community. So I think um, I've been working in this, I started working in 2005, um, looking for those, um, our own way of of addressing this issue. And I think even back then I was answering a call from 1999 where it was the minister saying somebody, you know, come up with an idea and here was my idea. And for a long time, I felt like um, it was really hard to just focus on that word, those two words, suicide prevention. And I think I was getting uh, discouraged writing my thesis on this until I was reminded by those young people that I'm actually writing about life. And I, I feel like that was really the impact, the positive impact that I saw in my own work was being able to shift the paradigm um, back to what the youth um, were telling us that they required to support in, in their life journey at that time. So. I feel like I've been really um, honored and humbled by being able to do this work in strengthening life and working in communities, whether it's as was a suicide prevention coach with the Center of Mental Health or helping to support uh, co-founding with John uh, Rice and Ed Connors, the 
uh, Feather Carriers Leadership for Life program in Simcoe, Muskoka. And I'm very happy that it's it's continuing on that work and that and the thunder and the Thunderbird part, you're the workbook, Connor, that you're involved in. It's I was um I, I guess that makes me feel really good in my heart that something that I've been thinking about so long has finally um, being manifested and actualized and put into action in our communities. And also grateful that um, strengthening life and life promotion has become such a central focus of um, our Anishinaabe uh, cultural continuity and, and reconnection to ourselves and, and our lands. So miigwech. Ahau miigwech. Um very uh, strong message in there about it being directed by the people that it's aimed towards. You're, the youth told um, you and everyone else what it was they needed. And that's um, a very core uh, ingredient, whether we're talking about suicide prevention or any way that we're addressing inequities in health for Indigenous people. And I really think we are starting to come to um, the, the lived experiences being so much more important now in all the work that we do. So miigwech for pointing that out. Um, Connor, I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit more on some of the lessons that you have learned in your work in life promotion. Yeah, definitely. I think that there are, uh, there's a twofold to this, this question. There are things that I've learned on the ground uh, from the Indigenous lens, um, you know, centering centering youth voices, centering everyone's voice at the table, going back to a time where everyone had a seat at the table and, and just knowing that regardless of your age, regardless of uh, what we would not now call stature, you you had a voice and you, you could use it in community. And so going back to that time uh, of just sharing and, and knowing between generations, but there's also the side of, of, of knowing it through the Western lens, um, of questioning the systems, of, of knowing the root of the issue and not trying to, to just solve a problem that shouldn't even exist in the first place. And so not go always going to, to the end and, and, um, I think we have a we have a hard time in mental health sometimes we just go to the end result we go to uh, the youth we go to the person that is affected by um by mental health challenges and we never we never look back or see the, the bigger picture and i think life promotion sees the bigger picture it sees how people are are born into a system that has their exclusion in mind that that, that we are not involved when it comes to um to health, like health and healing, we are we are not there. And so for me, life promotion um, just gets folks to see how the system is really influencing our, our life uh, and our death in, in many ways. Um, but for me also, it's, it's about letting folks ask all the questions that they have, um, whether that be from an Indigenous perspective or a non-Indigenous perspectives. I think people are skeptical when they hear something that is a little bit new, especially when it's something that is Indigenous based. And so, um, for me, it's really sitting down with folks, having those hard conversations and letting them ask all of the questions that they have, because if we don't start answering them, then people are, are left kind of unknowing of where to go from here. Um, but, it, but it's definitely about taking that step back and just and seeing the whole picture. Miigwech, Connor, I couldn't agree more. And I, I love how you said, you know, let's stop solving the problem. Let's get upstream and, and remove the problem. And that essentially is what life promotion is all about. I particularly enjoyed, you know, that you mentioned um, some people may be hesitant to look at Indigenous led practices. And I think I talked about that in my introduction. It was certainly we are not encouraging in any way, shape or form a duplication of what we do. It's all very specific to the target audience. If But the paradigm is there, the, um, the new tools of listening, the new tools of empowering voices within that work is what we can offer to share with non-Indigenous organizations, caregivers, people. So miigwech for that. I want to turn the discussion a little bit towards culture and identity. That certainly has been a huge element in the shift to life promotion in Indigenous communities. So I, I'd really like to spend some time hearing from you about that. So maybe we'll start with, with Deb. Um, talk to us about ways that life promotion initiatives have been honoring Indigenous cultures and traditional practices, if you could, please. The life promotion initiatives that um, I worked on I think the big one for me during the pandemic was um, helping to initiate and put up a, 
a teaching lodge, a learning lodge, Ishkagamikwewigwami at the University of Toronto. And um, <clears throat> I think that what I felt like at the time was the mental health and the isolation, um, also probably what I was feeling, but maybe really feeling that deep compassion for those students and, and where would they be able to go in the city of Toronto um, within that university community. And um, it was also unfortunate um, post an event that had actually occurred at the university and, you know, sort of my own idea of what could I, what could I offer? What could I help um, sort of build this community? I was really happy when the young students, I had heard later on, I don't live in Toronto anymore, so I'm not, um, that, you know, a couple of the young men had just found their way into the lodge and, and self-initiated singing in there, um, singing songs, and um, I guess just finding their own strength for life. So I think that anything that helps to answer those four essential questions that seems to be the foundation of framework, who am I, where did I come from, where am I going, and I'm like looking at Connor because I'm like, oh, I don't really work with these, these questions anymore, these four essential questions. But I think always having your thinking around those four essential questions and, and how is it that we can work to support our young people? Um, and also how we answer them as, our, as the supports, as the older people. So I think that we do have to be able to answer that for ourselves. Um, and so that we can we can create that community of care so that we can respond in whatever way we're being asked. What are you asking of me? All that you're asking of me in response to those ones who are picking up, um, you know, those ones coming behind me is, is how I think about that and how I, how I walk on my life path um, and how they're going to pick up, you know, their life bundles. Um, and how I'm able to, to support them too. But I'm also looking ahead where my grand, my ancestor block and what they showed me, what that was to have that, you know, Bamadzuin or, the, or that good life. So I feel like there's a, I guess a whole community or a whole way of thinking about the whole person and um, honoring, I guess, or reclaiming and also picking up um, those bundles that were left for us and then what those young ones are 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 picking up for themselves and how we can support them. Shimi Gwetch, um, when we were having discussions to prepare for this webinar, um, Debbie, you used a wonderful phrase. I think it was continuity of culture. Could you expand just a little bit on that and how that led you to, I'm assuming that's what led you, the need for that, to building that lodge, to make that accessible for students in that really colonized place. Could you speak to that just a little bit, please? Uh, yes. So I started the University of Toronto in 2000, and so the lodge wasn't there till 2020. And I, um, having gone through that system, you know, I, I, I had to go off site to find those things that kept me connected to my own identity so that I wouldn't be leaving myself outside the classroom. Um, I think it's, you know, leaving yourself outside of the door so I've been really focusing on cultural continuity. So that would referencing Chandler and Lalonde, of course, and, and, and what that means and expanding on that and how our traditions, practices, our original connection to our original thinking and who we are is really that protective factor um, against hopefully choosing to take your life, yourself out of this uh, life, off this life path but also strengthening your life bundle. So um, how we, I guess in one way, it's also like how we feast, feast that part, that spirit part of our own being and uh, make sure that we stay in that, that whole balancing of, of the whole individual, the physical, the emotional, the mental. This was, I'm like, oh, sorry, I got lost. I was, I, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, all of those aspects. So 
I feel like being able to um, connect into a lodge, for example, where all of the teachings of all of the Anishinaabe, but also welcoming other nations um, to share their own teachings um, from that space. I am happy to say that I believe that it has strengthened um, the community, but also as also, you know, also that part of cultural safety education. So um, being present in that most vi visible, visible way with this lodge on campus um, has, a, has, you know, caused other community building and discussions to happen. And it's hard to ignore who we are when there's a, well, I mean, it's not that big, but it's a 14 by 24 visible, visible structure that really says we are here, we have been here, and we're going to speak from the strength of the space and who we are. So I, I'm hoping that um, that our our young people too at the university, to the students, are able we're able to guide. It's very new. I know that other universities have had um, that for longer, but um, I'm happy that this work has has begun um, at that place and that location. How miigwech, me too. And, you know, for those of you who may be listening and thinking about, you know, this is specifically Indigenous based um, work that Debbie is talking about, when she talks about strengthening our spirit or our life bundle, she's talking about those four questions. She's talking about building up within people um, their uh, relationship with life again. And although the specifics that Deb has shared with us may be specific to actually even an a specific nation of Indigenous people, it's those concepts that we really want you to open your minds to and to try and uh, embrace. So miigwech for that. Connor, maybe you can talk about that way too, about that connection between honoring culture and practices within that life promotion lens. Yeah, I think that what you what you were saying was just absolutely beautiful. And I was absolutely mesmerized by what you were saying, because it's exactly how um, I live and experience life promotion as well. I think um, we're really focused on intergenerational healing and not leaving anyone behind. I think that is the focal point of how uh, life promotion for me operates. Um, when we think of life promotion, I know this is a conversation we often have of just like, this isn't new. You 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 step into any lodge, you uh, talk to any uh, elder or knowledge holder or auntie, and they'll tell you these things. They'll, they'll be able to, through our teachings, through our language, through our understanding of the world and the way the way it operates, all of this, this um, language around the life promotion just naturally occurs. The way that our, specifically my language operates in action and in, um, in, in the way that we speak about the world and our connection to it, I think that it is so integral to our practices to just see life everywhere because everything is based in a, a animation, in, in connection to the trees and the plants and the way that, that our lives have been shaped by all of these, these concepts. Um, I think there is an inability to separate Indigenous cultures from life because it is so integral to, to any, any concept. Um, I think uh, often when when I I connect uh, indigenous cultures and life promotion, I think of this recording of my great grandfather, where he's he's telling a story about um, about folks uh, coming to the river and and asking to 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 look to you know what's what's out there, asking asking questions about that. And um, I have this this recording of him, and he's just talking about how you need to take your time, and you need to listen to what the the trees are telling you, and you need to know where your footsteps are going because you're you're leaving that mark on the world, and and what will your grandchildren after you have? And although this is beyond, you know, this is way before life promotion as a um, as a concept came out, and and definitely reached, you know, in the bush in Dokis. Um, that's what he was talking about because that's what he lived. That's what he understood of the world because of his because of his knowledge of, of the world, uh, because of his cultures. Um, and so I think there's this inability of separate life from from our existence uh, because we are so rooted in connection in life, um, but also in 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 community uh, in, in the way that that our connection is is integral to our survival. Um, 
and even in the way that we talk about our seven generation principles of, you know, seven generations before me, what did they leave for me? And what am I leaving for seven generations in the future? Um, and life promotion directly connects me to seven generations in front of me. And I think that is uh, one of the most beautiful things that, that I can really think about. Uh, miigwech, Connor. I couldn't agree more. I remember very early putting my my feet on the path towards becoming more based in our cultural traditions that um, I was taught whenever we identify ourselves as Indigenous, it can never be singular. I can never say I am just one woman. By saying Anishinaabe Kwayandao, it includes all of those who went before me and all of those who will come after me. And I, I think that that um, continuation of that life cycle is, is embedded in life promotion as well, and in knowing that um, there are things greater than yourselves that are connecting you here. So chimi gwech for that. Um, I, I know that for many Indigenous people, identity is a hugely complex and incredibly difficult subject because it really was identity that was taken from us. I often speak about um, how we are now finally in Canada using the term genocide to talk about what happened to Indigenous people here. And for many people who aren't familiar uh, with this work, they think of genocide as, you know, everybody being killed, whereas in our case, we didn't all die, but we all had our identities ripped from us. The process of colonization and assimilation was lining us up against a wall and tearing out those identities. And a sense of self is really key to life promotion. So I, I'd like to ask the panelists to speak a little bit about how life promotion initiatives are strengthening Indigenous identities. And Karen, I'd like to start with you, if you don't mind. Not a problem. I think uh, it's a good segue from what Connor and Deb just shared um, for this, certainly. And as you mentioned, Kelly, the fact that uh, colonization and assimilation and all those other um, policies and acts that were put into place by government uh, years ago still impacts us today, uh, many generations later. Um, that's one of the things that we found in doing the Life is Sacred program that had the biggest impact on participants. And that was around the call, learning about the colonization and the impacts that it had on generation and it, the intergenerational trauma. One of the things too that we noticed when I worked in the treatment center, the young men that came in, uh, whether they be from a First Nation or an urban center, had no um, concept of who they were. Uh, that was lost and uh, not due to their, their uh, acts or anything. It was just the way the intergenerational trauma happened, even to myself, you know, and not being able to fully speak the language. But at the end, when we did the client satisfaction survey, uh, for the youth to find out what made the biggest impact for them, it was culture, hands down, culture, culture. I finally know who I am, where I come from, what, what that, where I, you know, they have a place in a sense now where they come from and who they are. And that's huge for them because a lot of the youth that we worked with had no idea. And we still continue to see that. And I think what we need to remember is that communities, we, are, we were taught through colonization that we weren't, didn't have the resources or the expertise per se, but that yes, we do. Our communities have the resources and the abilities to help their members. They have the elders, they have the ceremony, they have the knowledge, they have the choice in programming. And they have to realize and recognize that Indigenous ways of knowing are powerful. Language is key, ceremonies are key, teachings are key. And those relational connections that were severed for many generations are have to be fostered again and can be fostered um, to build on that Indigenous identity. Um, and I know we're going to talk about the land and in stuff further on so I won't get into to that too much but I think people just really need to to realize that life promotion definitely starts in the teachings in the language and certainly within uh, our own um, connections to land to community and to others. Aha, miigwech. 
And, um, you know, that concept of we, we've, we've talked about um, uh, generational trauma, we need to talk about generational uh, gifts and resiliency as well. And, you know, I was having a conversation recently with someone who is um, a child of immigrants and was having difficulties in the relationship with their parents. We don't talk about people, new people coming to this country, bring the trauma from that, their original culture with them. And so some of these things that we are facing in our communities are very, very similar to other populations. Again, that's why we wanted to have this conversation to see what success was for us in linking with identity, addressing um, hereditary trauma and turning that around into more positive life approaches. So Chimi Gwach for that. Um, Debbie, can you talk about that as well? You already have started talking about that strengthening um, of Indigenous identity, maybe talking about community strengths, if that would be okay. Hi. Um, well, first, I do want to acknowledge that um, if we only have come to know ourselves through the Indian Act, that doesn't really always feel positioned so great. And life promotion, I think, in connecting to identity was really that um, changing around also that that thinking or colonial belief or old, maybe it's just old thinking. I'm not sure that, um, you know, that being Indigenous is somehow a drawback. Um, in life or that um, that we already have mental health issues because we just happen to be indigenous. Um, and so that really speaks to a lot of um, unfortunate situations that I have personally got in being a visible Anishinaabe um, in reflection, not maybe to mental health services, but definitely at the hospital when they're assuming something about me um, and I do not participate in alcohol or drug use and yet I feel interrogated <laughs> um, almost bullied to uh, uh, let them know that so I think that there's still some challenges that we still have outside of our communities but um, hopefully these kinds of ways of being able to share um, I know maybe I'm touching on another question later on, but, you know, being able to share those lived experiences and not in a blaming or disparaging way, but, you know, even just sharing a little bit about my unfortunate issue, uh, experiences is at the, at the hospital, for example, and how I'm still seen. I, I think collectively, we, we still have a lot of, of work to do um, as communities. And I also I'm really think that that cultural continuity, and I mean, Karen, I couldn't have said what you said. I mean, you pretty much said it in such a great um, way, but, but being able then to see ourselves through that lens of the truth of who we are as Anishinaabe and our strengths of who we are as Indigenous uh, people in um, in relation with our land and each other. And, and, and what does that mean for us to be able to build community? Um, at one time we were born into these communities. So we had all of that pretty much figured out within that community. But, you know, we're migrating people. We have been relocated a lot. So I feel that that cultural continuity and how we continue to build and strengthen um, who we are then I think that helps to give voice. So I'm not afraid to speak up at the hospital if I'm feeling like, hey, wait a minute. But I also know that other people that might not be carrying that, um, that value and belief in knowing um, their own value might be a little more shy um, to speak up and advocate for themselves. So I feel like um, hopefully through the work that we do as communities, we're, we're uh, growing together, we're we're strengthening together. We're um, and our communities, and then the broader community. So, I mean, however, however you self-identify as a community member, whether you're 
indigenous or or non-indigenous or however you identify I think that collectively I'm excited that's um another way to transfer what's been going on in our communities to some of our non-indigenous practitioners is that definition of what community is what is the community that is Im embedded in the work that you're doing um as as we have had to identify that as well Connor I'd like to turn it over to you for a minute, and I, I want you to talk to us, if you don't mind, about why lived um, and living um, perspectives are so important when addressing Indigenous mental health and life promotion initiatives, and what, um, you know, messages there are in there for all of our attendees today. I think that is a wonderful question and a beautiful segue from the, the previous question as well. Um, I think it, it I, at a first glance, it's really important to acknowledge the history of imposing systems onto Indigenous people. So uh, when we when we think about our reserve system, when we think about how we access mental health, physical health, school, um, law, politics, anything like that, any of those systems have been uh, stripped away from, from our original governing systems and imposed onto us. So when we think about mental health and those systems, they are coming from a Western lens, a Western lens that is often uh, patriarchal, that is very imposing, that is very harmful for our communities directly. And so when we have the opportunity to hear from Indigenous people, from Indigenous perspectives and lived experiences, it shifts the lens. When we think about um, the way medicine is done, the way medicine is studied, it comes from uh, a lens that is very distant from uh, the person experiencing it. So often when we are accessing therapy or medication, it is given as a one size fits all. Oh, this has been statistically proven. This is a study. This is being given to us uh, and it will work. And it, it is beyond uh, trauma. It is beyond experience. It is based on statistics. And as Indigenous people, we are always becoming statistics. And that is not how um, we should be seen. That is not how we live and operate. And therefore, when we give uh, Indigenous perspectives and we are able to uh, gain agency in our communities, especially when it comes to our health, we are able to um, re redraw those lines and give our, our experiences of trauma, our experiences of uh, discrimination, and all of those systems that are, be that are being imposed onto us begin to slowly um, you know, remove us from its grips. And so it's so important to hear from Indigenous people. We have different perspectives. We have different understandings of how the world works and how the world has um, sh made us into uh, what they wanted us to be. Uh, and so when we when we're given that that lens, we are able to actually do what's best for our communities because we know we know what we need, we know what we want, and we know what would help us. And so when we when we have that opportunity to tell people, um, we can really begin to heal. Uh, and just to acknowledge, even in this panel, being able to uh, be from completely different communities, complete different understanding of the world, yet we all build on a similar understanding. You know, despite being so different and having not spoken about all of our answers, we are able to add continuously to the conversation, building upon each of our answers. And that speaks to that connection, that speaks to that foundation of, uh, of the root of our understanding of uh, Indigenous identities and also life promotion. How to make which, Connor, you're absolutely right. So let's move the conversation now to relationship between life promotion and suicide prevention. Maybe we'll start with you, Karen. And from your perspective, how is life promotion changing the narrative in the field of mental health for all Canadians? And, and, and talk about that relationship and how that paradigm shift can be helpful. Miigwech. Um, <clears throat> certainly, I think... Um... The increase uh, that we see on on social media and in public, you know, TV about, especially around let's Bill's Let's Talk Day, helps to decrease that stigma and bias around those that have mental health issues for sure. Um, I think if you were to poll, I know when we do our um, Life is Sacred program and take it to the communities, we ask participants in in the beginning who has who has contemplated at some point in their life suicide. Just about everybody has been impacted either by an ideation, and certainly many of us that have family members and communities uh, have personally felt the loss of a family member, a friend that has lost their life due to suicide. So everybody is, is impacted in some way. I think being able to talk about it and bring up the fact that yes, people have mental health issues. 
um, to varying degrees throughout their life at different points in their life in that it's normal. It's okay to talk about it um, because before it was something you didn't talk about in your families and in, in communities. Um, but now I think the acceptance and in, in part of it, again, attributed from the public media support, increased media and social media certainly is helping that. I think the fact too that switching uh, to the to the strength based empowers grassroots to make change and contribute to solutions. I really believe um, my colleague here uh, shared right person, right place, right time, and I think that's really important because that in external expertise doesn't, as we know, always fit what we need as Indigenous people. And um, for so long and so often, we were told that we needed external expertise um, coming in to do our work for us or to fix it for us. And, and that's not the case. I think in, in, in many times we have the expertise uh, in our communities, in our elders, in our colleagues, and uh, empowering people to be able to say, you're at the right place at the right time, and you're the right person to deal with this. You don't have to have a psychologist degree um, to be able to handle this type of stuff. So just my thoughts. Miigwech, Karen. It's, it's been, I've been spending more and more time recently thinking about um, the changes that in our whole society, um, we are very accustomed these days to physical health prevention. We've been talking about proper diet and exercise. We've been talking about nurturing a healthy physical being. I don't know if any of you on the call are quite as old as I am, but remember the participation moments on television? What if we had mental health participation moments? What if we encourage the pursuit of mental wellness the same way we encourage the pursuit of physical wellness? I, I leave that for you to think about. Connor, your thoughts? please. Thank you. Um, I think it's it's really imperative to understand how suicide prevention is being propagated in our communities. Um, when I talk to a lot of Indigenous youth, um, it is very clear that because the only thing revolving around mental health for Indigenous people is death-based, they only see themselves through that lens. And so if Indigenous youth everywhere, only the only thing on the news that, that they see around their health and healing is about uh, suicide epidemics or suicide prevention, then they are only seeing themselves through a death-based lens. And that is what you can hear everywhere on Turtle Island and beyond. If you are only being told that your only fate is death or preventing death, that that is your two only options, then how are you supposed to start living? How are you supposed to want to, to, to start living and, and gathering the tools that you need to do so when all that you hear is narrative around your death. And I think that, that that's where suicide prevention and life promotion kind of are distinguished. It's not to replace suicide prevention because suicide prevention is an integral tool that helps millions of people and it is needed. However, it is not the only conversation. We need to recenter our focus around left, around life and living rather than always focusing on death. So the way that I see life promotion is as the umbrella and suicide prevention being only one of the fa the many facets of how we can promote that life, how we can promote health and healing for our communities. It's also a very limiting term. When we talk about suicide prevention, it is a very strict set of guidelines of what is considered suicide. When life promotion talks about death, um, death-based conversations, we also talk about premature unnatural deaths. And that is not limited to suicide prevention, but talks to the global understanding of where why our people are dying. So it talks about poverty, it talks about disease, it talks about the socioeconomical stature that we find ourselves in in our communities. It is not limited to this, this singularity of death because we are, we are dying at alarming rates in many different ways and we need to address those. But because we are operating through a suicide prevention lens, we do not have the language to address it. So when we are shifting those narratives, it can open up and, and really begin to, to look at the root of, of why our why our youth, why our people um, are unable to hold on to life. Chimi Gwach Connor, and I'm going to just reiterate that because I think it's at a point worth, you know, pounding a couple of times is that suicide is that very narrow definition. And when we look at doing this work just through suicide prevention, our hands are tied to accessing a whole bunch of other resources and a whole bunch of other people that may need help. When we look at premature, unnatural death, we're looking at trying to create 
um, a way to promote life in everyone, not just those who may fall under suicide ideation um, or, or contemplation. So we have about four minutes left before we turn to our Q&A portion. Um, and I just like um, maybe starting with Karen, going through Connor and Deb, if we have time to just give us some final thoughts on life promotion moving forward. What do you see as the next steps, both in your indigenous communities that you're working in and perhaps in mainstream as well? So just some quick overview in the next few minutes about where are we, where are we going next? Well, okay, so to start out, like I mentioned, I work with the Life is Sacred Suicide um, Intervention Life Promotion from, uh, Program Training. Uh, where we're taking that next is to the uh, suicide intervention. So that's the next, uh, I guess, phase two we're going to implement into it, into the program. And the reason being is we've heard from our treatment centers that we work with, there's 10 right across the country, that um, the mainstream, I guess, suicide programs, um, well, you know, uh, don't hit the mark. They're not culturally relevant. They don't make sense. And, and even after you pay so much money, I guess the costs are high to be facilitators for some of those programs. And um, staff didn't feel confident and community members don't feel confident in, in providing those mainstream programs, which is why this program was, was created in the first place to give um, a staff uh, some insight into suicide prevention and inter and now we want to do the intervention portion of it. So that's what YSAC is working on. Uh, it's going to, going to be rolled out in the new year, new fiscal year. And um, we're hoping that it'll give uh, another option for our treatment centers in our community based, uh, more colored, culturally relevant program that the mainstream programs haven't been able to provide. Miigwech. Connor? I think um, my answer would be quite quite simple. Um, it's to question. Question who is at your table, question who is not at your table, and question why there are barriers to accessing your table in the first place. You know, why, why are there limits? Why are you not seeing the people that are affected the most, making the decisions and, and making changes in the world? And that, that really is, if I can leave you with one piece of information, is just to question. And because you can never over question, because if you are, then you're just doing something right. If the answer is just like, we have it, you know, there is no harm in, in asking questions and, and continuing your, your learning journey of never feeling like you know enough. Um, like Karen said at the beginning, we are all lifelong learners. We are not, we are not uniquely experts in one specific field. I learned so much from this panel as much as um, I'm assuming all of you did. And so to question, to listen, and to learn. Chimi Gwetch, Connor, Debbie. Um, I've been thinking about this question uh, answer it has something to do with, I believe that um, it comes from also all every child matters. So we're also now grown up children. And I think there's a continuation of what that means to value um, our life as we have it. And I want to extend that thinking of, I think that the Thunderbird Partnership cultural framework is such a great tool for looking at the whole person and the whole community. And I do believe, and I also again want to thank those youth that were thinking way back then in 2015, uh, maybe 13, about they must have had hope. <laughs> they must have had hope that we'd, we'd uh, be able to create um, a community around um, that word life promotion and what it meant because they also were looking for that belonging and uh, meaning in their own life and also what their purpose or roles and responsibilities. But I think that that extends to um, all of the people on the entire planet. <laughs> that I hope that um, we continue to work collectively um, in community, individually in our families, individually in our own beliefs, and that we're able to um, actualize or put into action 
um, hope, belonging, meaning, purpose, or, or what is my roles and responsibilities, being able to work from that framework of answering those um, four questions for ourselves, because I, I think that if we're going to be able to reconcile just life in general, that um, I think that we all might be needing to look in that direction and what um, good things are there for, for us too, and then maybe decide to put down some of those older narratives that might not be working for us anymore in this modern contemporary society. And as our young people lead us into that next, uh, that next fire being lit, so uh, miigwech. How miigwech. Miigwech to all of you. This has been um, such an amazing conversation and there's been so much for us to think about and unpack. But we do have some time allotted now for some questions from uh, the attendees at today's webinar. I'm going to ask you respectfully if you can pose your questions, not so much in the chat box as that's quite busy, but in the um, Q&A section so that I can find the questions there and be able to share them with uh, the panelists. Um, don't worry about which language you prefer to pose your question in. We have people that will translate that uh, for us to ask those questions. And I'll also ask if you have a specific, specific panelist, you would like to answer your questions to please let us know what that is. Um, so one of the first questions we've got, and this is a very uh, complex question, but maybe we can have a very um, cursory sort of understanding of this. And I'm going to ask Deborah to answer this question because it's specifically about the phrase you used, life bundle. Um, and I'm wondering if you can just take a minute to explain that, uh, both from an Indigenous perspective and how that concept of a life bundle may work with non-Indigenous audiences. Debbie, are you okay with that? Um, so the life bundle for Anishinaabe is all of the physical and non-physical um, things that you would carry in your life. So whether it's something a physical, this uh, feather, for example, and how it has the entire life path teaching on it as a physical reminder. But but then the teaching that goes along with that is the non, I guess it's physical, but it's not something you can touch. Um, so what is it that's left for us on, so when I described our different thinking of, uh, I guess, geometrically, so the, the future coming behind me and those young people, those little ones following and what was ahead of me on my grandparents that and my parents that left a trail um, ahead of me. So what is it that I'm able to pick up from them? What am I carrying in my own life bundle? And, and what, am I, what am I leaving? I guess not really leaving, but what am I supporting or sharing with those ones coming behind me? So I think that's our life bundle being all of those things. How, I mean, in directing to other people's conversations, um, I guess it could be the, your own stories of your own family, how you uh, continue to, um, pick up that good life thinking and how you're able to, and I don't, whatever that means, I, um, one of the examples I used was, um, from a mainstream perspective was when I sent my, at the time, troubled teenager to Outward Bound for the six weeks, um, in, you know, lieu of putting him in a fasting camp at that time, and when he came back, he, he, his, I could visibly see how shiny his spirit was and how strong he was from being on and with the land. Also how water gives us life. So if somebody's not feeling really well and they haven't uh, washed for a long time, maybe coming and helping somebody have a shower is, a, is an act of life promoting just even thinking of that water as the medicine. So I think that I guess, I don't know how to answer how someone else can pick up their life 
bundle, but I hope that I described what it means from an Anishinaabe and Endemowin, like our thinking. Um, so it's our in our name, it's our clan, it's where we come from, are also part of our life bundle. And um, yeah, just sharing that thinking, um, those every nation of person would have to decide what those life promoting life bundles would be for um, each individual and each community. Yeah, I think it's really about um, finding the gifts that you carry, finding uh, your your life bundle is made up, you know, of, of all of the opportunities that are placed in you. I know when talking with my, uh, my daughter and some of her friends, they, you know, someone was afraid to get the driver's license. I'm really afraid to learn how to drive. What if I, I do something bad? What if I kill somebody? And changing the narrative to what if you're really good at it? What if you are able then to transport your great auntie or your great uncle to places they wouldn't have gone without you. Changing that what if to positives as opposed to negatives is about building, um, building our bundle. Um, Connor, there's a question here I'd like to direct to you if you don't mind. Do you see a link between trauma-based approaches and suicide prevention frameworks that life promotion can expand into? Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, I think that life promotion is is something that is so um, adaptable to any situation. And so I don't see any limits for it uh, going into, I think you said, uh, trauma-based interventions. Um, I think that there is beauty in in all of the interventions that have already been created. And it's it, life promotion isn't there to be like, oh, you know, take all of these out. We don't want to see them anymore. There is there is beauty to these systems and there are ways that they have helped so many people. But life promotion comes uh, in, into the lens of just understanding that it isn't always just about death. It's really about uh, like the other things that are that are that are part of life. Um, so it's definitely. Um, I'm trying to find the question so I can refer to it, uh, but I do think that life promotion comes in uh, as a as a tool to 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 latch on to uh, to trauma based interventions to like to suicide prevention as a way to to expand on it. I think you did a fine job, uh, Connor. Thank you so much. And for those of you who have asked questions, if I'm skipping over them, it's because we have more questions than we can possibly answer. Uh, but we will do our best to answer those questions um, and have them attached to uh, this um, webinar when it is able to be um, downloaded. Um, Here's an interesting question, and Karen, I'm not sure if, if you feel comfortable, and you're certainly welcome to say no, but um, here's a question. When we do risk assessment at our agency, we ask clients about their reason to live, and that's trying to be strength-based, to reframe the focus on life. How do you think we could extend that question and conversation to be even more life-promoting? Are you comfortable with that, Karen? Um. I guess because, yeah, risk assessment is something you have to do in your treatment centers. Um, I think it's always good to get people. What we try to do is get them to look further in the future, right? So anything that has to do with the future, what are you looking forward to? Or can you tell us what you're, uh, to engage them to look further than just today? is always any question that gets them to look in the future, I think helps with that life promotion because then they can engage and see themselves in the future. So I don't know if that answered it, but a specific question, uh, you can phrase a question in any way, but how do you get them to look past today is what we say we want them to do. Uh, I know vision boarding is something too that if you get a chance to work with young people to be able to get them to do a vision board because a vision board is looking right all their hopes and dreams and and ideas for the future and to have them take some time to do that also puts them in the future. How Hope that helps you. somewhat. I think that's a great answer, Karen Miigwech, for that. Um, I don't know who to extend this question to, so maybe I'll ask for volunteers. You can raise your finger if you want to jump in. Don't be polite, because I think all of you may have an answer to this question. How do we prevent cultural appropriation in implementing this life promotion approach? I certainly have my own personal feelings on that, but I would like to hear from you. Who'd like to go first? 
some of you, somebody has to. Connor, do you have any thoughts on this or shall I go on to the other? I can definitely jump in. Um, I think that it's important to look at, at the root of what you're doing. Um, I- examples in the Life Promotion Toolkit, I work with a lot of um, mental health organizations and, and right now we're working with implementing it directly into schools. And that is a big concern with teachers. They're like, how do we take this indigenous life promotion toolkit and apply to non-Indigenous students. And I think it is based on intention. It is based on what you what you hope to gather from it, what you hope to give, and, and why you are using those specific tools. So if it's, it's an activity on vision boarding and you're you're following the activity, then that is that is beautiful. You know, it's you're not you're not taking an indigenous concept and applying it to yours. You're not taking um an indigenous, you know, uh craft as in something that is crafted, not craft as in arts and crafts. Uh, to to use it in your classroom. But if you are taking, you know, a, a drumming circle or making rattles or things that are specific to culture, then it is really questioning why you are taking that intention. It is just because you like these things and you think it's cool or you think that it is something that, that would be interesting to do versus, you know, bringing in a knowledge holder to actually facilitate those activities and do it in the proper way. So it's really based on intention and what you hope to, to get from the experience um, but the thing with with these these activities and the different ways of implementing is that it can be applied to any culture. It can be applied to any landscape. And so it is, is really about taking what the intention of the activity is and applying it to your context. So if in your culture you have um, a specific item that you like to make, you can take the intentions that are that are with our specific items and apply it to yours because it, it is very transferable. Um, and in the way that the toolkit was created, it's really based on where, you know, all over Turtle Island, we have different cultures, different identities, different ways of being. And so it, it's really applicable, um, but it, it really based on, on why you are choosing this specific thing to do. And in a nutshell, it won't work. If you're trying to implement cultural or sorry, life promotion using Indigenous cultural practices with a non-Indigenous audience, it shouldn't work. The whole reason that we have started to develop programming within our communities is that mainstream programming didn't work for us because it didn't include our our way of being, our way of knowing, our sense of community, our sense of self, the challenges that 500 years of colonization have left with us. So we needed to step outside of that norm and address our culture. It's the same with your target audience. If you're dealing with um, a population of new Canadians, for example, they're bringing trauma with them from their country countries of origin, they're bringing issues of trying to walk um, a very difficult balance between a, a hereditary identity and trying to fit into Canadian society. So we're not going to help them with thousand year old indigenous cultural methodologies because they aren't theirs you need to listen to them what are their cultural norms what are their ways of feeling heard and seen and involved in the work so really cultural appropriation shouldn't work in life promotion you have to target your audience you have to target your demographic you have to target your community we are all communities and we don't have to say who's got it worse or who's got it better. We just need to make sure our communities are heard within this work. Anyone else want to comment on that, Karen or Debbie, about cultural appropriation? Or are we okay? No, I think we're okay. I think um, you're very right. I think the, the, the Indigenous viewpoints have to come from Indigenous people. And if somebody's going to be I guess, teaching life promotion, they're going to have to self-identify in the beginning. Um, I've certainly worked with a lot of um, great people over the years, non-Indigenous included too. And, you know, there's there's definitely some people that have some, want to learn as much as they can and, and, uh, and help and be good students. Um, but yeah, they, they have to self-identify that. I may have learned this, but it's not mine. And when we go to the communities, even the difference in, you know, because around here there's Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Cree, Soto, and they have different, um, the different communities have different beliefs um, in different language. And so we need to be cognizant of where we're going and how we're saying things and give them the opportunity to be able to share what, what their knowledge is. We're not going in with what is right. Yeah. Wow, miigwech. Debbie, did you want to add or are you okay? I think the only thing that I would add is, 
yeah, looking within your own community. I also think that whole belonging, meaning, and purpose are roles like what am, what am I supposed to be doing? I like however you come to answer those questions. I think that that is a core part of well being a young person when you get to that wondering and wandering or fast life stage when you're like oh what am I doing? And um, so however we can answer that from whatever space that we occupied. So I, I think it also involves really listening to those young people again. They might actually know how to um, answer whether it's in a risk, ass risk assessment or strengths-based. Um, maybe the way we, the questions that we're asking could be reframed to uh, that lens that is more intuitive to what, it, what actually gives meaning, what, what actually gives meaning to life as being a human being as a generalized question. And I kind of think we're very intelligent humans. Uh, collectively, we should be thinking really well together. And um, I have a lot of hope um, that we can collectively figure figure something out. Miigwech. Um, I'm going to, and this is my own personal bias, I'm going to ask this question to Connor, because I think it has a youth uh, concept. The question is, can we use social media to promote life? I think social media is a great platform that can connect a lot of individuals. Uh, personally, I have been connected to my team uh, that created Life Motion Toolkit only via social media uh, since the creation of the toolkit because we have never met in person. I've met some of them in between, but social media has been our tool for connecting life promotion and to, to reaching out to youth. Often uh, in our um, our remote communities, you know, that's the only way we can reach them, you know, having webinars, having uh, posters that are virtually shared through Instagram and Facebook and other such platforms. I think that social media can be a great tool to promote life and a great way to hold each other accountable, to have connection, but it just cannot be the only way that we are promoting life. Um, so it is, I, I, I believe in social media as a great platform platform to do so because you can reach so many um, and, and make so many people feel seen, especially when we're talking about intersectional identities, it is a great platform to do so. And I think it allows people to choose if they want to be seen or not, so they can be um, uh, built into the conversation without having to be vulnerable um, on social media because they don't have to engage if they choose not to, right? So that's a good way to encourage that. So we have just a few more minutes left, about five minutes left um, to wrap up. And there's an interesting question that I would like to pose to each one of our panelists as our way of wrapping up this conversation. So the question is, what's one single thing that you can identify to enforce life promotion versus suicide prevention? It's a little tough but one concrete step that we can take uh, for people who are brand new to shifting this narrative, shifting this paradigm, uh, what's one perhaps step or tool that you can offer? And I'm going to start with you, Connor. That is a really good question. And I was hoping that you would not start with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, um, when it comes to that 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 initial shift from life promotion to suicide prevention, I think of the first time that I was learning about what suicide, what what life promotion meant, and how that really is is a is a huge concept that really can just be boiled down. Um, I think it, it's really about understanding where you're leading folks, and understanding how how they are being ta taught and understand mental health, and so um, changing the, the the lens of just like just talking about, like I said, the death-based dying versus talking about all of the beautiful things um, that exist and all, all of the, the attributes a person has and, and giving back that agency. Uh, because when you talk about mental health and, and suicide, you're, there's often a lack of agency. And that is one of the, the, the foundational pieces of, of that, those struggles. Um, so by giving that agency and by questioning the, those pieces of life, uh, I think that is that, that first initial step in, in changing that narrative. Very well said, Miigwech, Connor. Karen? I think I liken um, life promotion to uh, if you've heard of appreciative inquiry. And uh, the basis of that is the more you focus on the positive, 
the more you're going to emanate and the more positive you're going to have. And same with life promotion. I, I think our program is life is sacred. And um, I guess what we want to get through to people is everybody is here for a reason. Creator put you on this earth for a reason. Um, and your, your life matters. You're valuable as part of this whole intricate um, creation and the story in this earth for your community, your family, and um, trying to take a look again at the strengths that um, people have, communities have, um, that can work to, to promote that um, versus, uh, again, you know, the, the deficit-based suicide prevention. Um, that the creation and the Indigenous ways of knowing all really um, come from life promotion. Um, and that's where I think we need to focus on more to build more on that strength-based thought. Chimi Debbie. I am going to send everybody outside. <laughs> For 20 minutes with no phones and no technology and go to that place where life comes from. Um, ask those questions, sit on our collective mother, the earth, and um, take that time. I do give this to my students. I I've I've, think I've calculated probably 400 students I've sent over my 17 years of teaching. Um, at university and 20 minutes the first time, then half an hour, then an hour, um, just sitting um, without your fasting with your would be, I call it technologically fasting. So going to that place where life comes from, um, sitting and you might be surprised that you're, uh, you may be able to answer that question um, when you sit with where life comes from to answer how to find out more about life promotion. You, you might be surprised that you are actually a life promoter. You're actually um, doing that and you might not even be thinking it. So I'm that would be my last thought would be, because I'm a teacher giving homework <laughs> outside 20 minutes, 30 minutes, then an hour. And um, maybe you will find the answers to um, some of those questions um, that you have. Uh, Currently, Amy Gwach, um, this has been a most remarkable conversation. I cannot express enough my gratitude for uh, being part, the privilege of being part of this conversation, um, sitting in conversation with Karen and Connor and Debbie. Um, and there are so many questions in the chat box and in the Q&A box that we haven't been able to address. Uh, certainly, if you wish to be in contact with Alexi Laplante, she will um, try and make sure that those questions get answered and get back to you. We will work backstage to do that. Um, I, I think that there's a very valuable gift that's been shared today, and that's the gift of being able to just sit and contemplate a new approach to the work that you are all doing, that we recognize and honor um, the work of all caregivers working in life promotion. Um, it is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly draining to our own souls, to our own life bundles, to our own, um, our, our own assets. And when we can sit together and support one another and have these conversations, it gives us an opportunity to think about what if. Uh, my uh, small contribution to what is the first step is really a culmination of what all of our panelists said today, which is, um, you know, it will start with you, with you knowing yourself, with you being aware of when you um, fall into established roles and routines because that's how you've been taught and a recognition that maybe are deficit based and uh, you know just the ability to say is there a different way is there a way that we can base this 
in promoting life, in talking about gifts and assets, in encouraging that connection to um, self and to life and to life bundles, rather than trying to stop something that may have already started. Um, and with that, I will say again, a heartfelt miigwech in my language, we say uh, to our panelists, to the Mental Health Commission of Canada for uh, inviting you all here today and for all of you who have been with us today. You are going to see um, some final questions. Another poll pop up on your screen. Please take a moment to answer those poll questions. Um, they advise the commission on how we can better suit you um, in future webinars. And again, to all of you, miigwech, thank you so much. Merci.